Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Andrew. And I'm Rachel. And we are Pictures of the Scene podcast. We are a true crime podcast aiming to put you, the listener, at the scene of the crime. We're here this week and every week to give you crimes that we find interesting, and hopefully you will too. Give you crimes? Yes, we give them crimes, yes. On a platter. Have this crime. I tend to lean towards the lesser known crimes from the UK and Ireland, but not exclusively those, and Rachel tends to go towards the larger, well-known cases, but again, not exclusively. If you like what you hear, and you don't already, please find us on your social medias. Just search for our name, Picture the Scene Podcast. Now, there does seem to be a band out there with the same name, so if you happen to find their pages by accident, I can't play the guitar, and I'm pretty certain Rachel wouldn't know which end of a drumstick to hold. Oof, I thought you were going to comment on my singing, guys. Mm. We know you're a great singer. But if you listen to us on purpose and you think to yourself, I like a bit of that and I've got a bit of change in my virtual wallet, then you can support us on Patreon. You can find us by searching for the word Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N and our name and you will find us. Or there is also a link in our show notes. And for all those people that do support us already, thank you so much. We really do mean that. And for all of those who don't support us, but you do enjoy our content, please do say a word of thanks to our Patreon supporters, because without them, we wouldn't be able to do this week in and week out. Yeah, and as some other very well-known pod always says, we want to be doing this for a long time, not just a good time. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, always great to be supported in any way, shape or form, uh, but especially from our patrons. So thank you. Yes. Now we do, where possible, now release our episode of the week early for our Patreon supporters. So you don't have to be Nostradamus and try to predict when McDonald's will bring their chocolate pie back by looking into the future. All you have to do is subscribe to it on Patreon to experience the future today. McDonald's do a chocolate pie? They did a chocolate pie and it stopped about a month and a half ago. It was like the apple pie, but all chocolate. Wow. It was well. No, <laughs> Now, bear with me, everyone, because the boring part is almost over. But as with any True Kind podcast, listener discretion is always advised. And today is no exception as, and Rachel's favourite words here, spoiler alert, we are dealing with a complete twat today who did bad things. Wow, okay. There will be no differing opinions on this show today, guys. We both will agree that he is a complete twat. Yes. So, Rachel, how are you doing? Are you still awake after all of that? I am. And how are you doing? I was trying to, I was trying to judge it up a little bit with my uh, entertaining comments. Your comments are always entertaining, Rachel. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm good, thank you. How are you? I am sparkling. Yay! You know, it's real sparkling when he says it without me saying him, uh, asking him if he's anything but good. Yes, indeed. And the most important question of all time. Are you ready for some true crime? Oh, yes. So, if it's safe for you all to do so, I'd like you to relax. Close your eyes and picture the scene. Today, I want to take us to Stonely, which is in the Epson area of Surrey. Now, the town of Epson is generally classed to most as being in the suburbs for London, due to it being located only 14 miles from the centre of London, and it has a population of just over 30,000 people. Now, it's a reasonably nice area, probably most well known for its natural spa waters and the famous Epsom Downs horse racing course that is there that hosts the famous races at Derby and the Oaks. So let's go back to Stoney, shall we, though? And we're going back to the 8th of February, which, coincidentally, Rachel, is my wife's birthday, but there'll be no celebrating on this day by Alini Godino. It would just be a normal day for her. Now, Alini was with her three-year-old daughter and she'd just gotten off the bus on London Road in Stoneley, along with a number of other mums as they were headed off to a local primary school to pick up their children. Now, Alini had four children in total. One daughter, the three-year-old that she had with her, and three sons, two of whom went to the school that Alini was headed off to and another who attended secondary school. Now, it's a little after 3 p.m., it was a cold day, around 11 degrees Celsius, which is around 52 degrees Fahrenheit. 
It had been raining on and off all day, so the ground was wet, but at this moment in time it wasn't raining and there wasn't much wind. Now both Alini and her daughter had their coats on, with both of them having their hoods pulled up over their heads for their coats, and the little girl had gloves on too. Now Alini and her daughter, they were talking as they walked. Now I'm not sure what about, but I imagine it was like the conversations that happen with kids that age most of the time. Completely pointless, but also completely delightful as well. Now all of a sudden, Alini and the other mums could hear a car speeding up behind them. And most of them turned around to look, including Alini. Now she must have recognised the Ford Ranger pickup truck because she tried to flee as soon as she saw it, as it had now mounted the curb and was speeding towards them. As witnesses and CCTV would capture, they would capture her trying to run, not being able to run very fast, because she was holding her daughter's hand, and her daughter, being three years old, couldn't run very fast. Now the truck came to a screeching halt. They didn't hit anyone, and a man jumped out of the truck holding a large knife. Alini put her hands up to defend herself, but it was all too quick for her. The man approached her, utterly calm, not an ounce of emotion on his face. However, Alini had terror on hers. The man quickly made three jabs with a knife, two to her neck and one to her chest, as she let out a scream. She then became lifeless as she fell to the floor, the man stabbing her lifeless body three or four more times in the chest. Oh my goodness. Okay, so where was her three-year-old, like, witnessing all of this? Next to her, yes. Oh, my goodness. How traumatic for everyone. I I mean, obviously, Alina, because she's the victim, but for everyone else just in the middle of the day in February, for that to have happened, this is awful. Yeah, well, I say that she was next to her because at some point, either a man or Alina, there'd been different reports on this had pushed the daughter away from the incident as it happened. So one of the two had pushed her away, but she wasn't, like, far away. How far can you push Mm. a little girl away? Yeah, and you're going to hear your mum's screams, aren't you? And the commotion and probably the other parents, you know, who are the other mums that are with her, they're going to be erratic. Like, a three-year-old is not going to forget that incident, unfortunately. Yeah, no, exactly right. And even though she had been stabbed six or seven times, the entire attack, it only lasted 17 seconds, Rachel. With the man looking at the little girl after he had finished, and then he dropped a knife and he calmly walked away. So Jeez. actually, that that the little girl must have been looking at him doing it, mm. if, if he looked at the little girl. So, like, you keep on referring to the man as totally calm. I just, no I mean, emotion. I get it, like, When you talk about frenzied attacks, you think people are being stabbed like 20, 30 times, like, you know, multiple, but still seven insertions, like, and to do that all calmly. In 17 seconds. In 17 seconds, it just doesn't compute for me. Like, they say stabbing is really intimate as well, don't they? Like, in terms of, obviously, you have to be really close to the, the, the victim. And, um, you know, almost you, you're able to like look them in the whites of the eyes at the time. And yeah, to, to, yeah, to just be like no emotion whilst this woman's screaming out and, and crying and distressed. Yeah. Well, she only screamed once because apparently by the time she'd been stabbed the third time, she was already dead. The first two stabs in the neck had killed her. Uh, but then he still stabbed her three more times as she collapsed to the floor, so... Um, and he obviously knew what he was doing then if he killed her with the first two two goes to the neck, hey? Because, yeah. like, I mean, obviously I understand, like, again, in terms of, like, main arteries, blood supply in the neck is is crucial, isn't it? Um, yeah. But, uh, but, yeah, to just to d- launch in and, and kill her with, with um, the initial, like, two stabs is... Um, he, he knew what he was doing, didn't he? He did indeed, yeah. The other mums who got off the bus and some also who were driving towards the school in their cars but had stopped when they saw what happened, they all leapt into action. Now, let's not forget some of these had 
young children with them. Yeah. Too. So it wasn't just alone as adults. Now, some of them went to Alina to see what they could do to help her. And some made sure they shielded her daughter so that she didn't see her mum like that anymore. What year was this? Yeah, apologies. I forgot I never actually said, did I? This was in 2019. Okay, so obviously we are talking about the age of camera phones as well. So I'm hopeful that someone took the initiative to get the guy's number plate and potentially even like an image of him, like in, in the midst of the attack. Like, obviously, I know for most people that is not normal protocol to think oh i'm just going to get my phone but there there is always inevitably someone at the scene of a crime isn't there that that thinks i've got to capture this yes as i said the attack on alini was really severe rachel and it was likely that she was already dead before she hit the floor one of the mums was reported as saying now we don't know if the mum was mistaken and thought she was still alive, or she did last a few more seconds. But one of the mums was saying that as she was passing, she leaned forward and she told her that her daughter was safe and unhurt, hoping that it would help her pass away peacefully. Wow. That's been that. I, I actually cried a little bit when I wrote that yesterday. And then, it, um, yeah, I'm having to stop myself now, Rachel. It's just a horrible image to think of, isn't it? But yeah, that's giving me goosebumps because being a mum, like, especially like in such the midst of such a, a violent attack, your next thoughts or your 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 first thoughts will be, you know, protect my child at all costs and um and to be down on the ground um and and fighting for life, knowing that your daughter is okay. Uh, yeah, that absolutely would be, you know, something peaceful to. To, yeah. to acknowledge. Now, remember that some of the mums were with them, Alini and some were shielding the daughter from seeing anything. So one of the mums who was with her daughter, and I keep saying daughter because her name was obviously never published. Now, one of the mums who was with her daughter, and now I assume this to be true because I'm not sure why she'd make it up. She said that the daughter suddenly said, mummy's gone away and she's not coming back. Oh, my God, that's heartbreaking. Is, Again, it? you know, at three, I mean, I appreciate I'm thinking back to four four years ago with my daughter, but I, I remember the time and her development quite well because of COVID, but at three, like, they are sponges. They're taking in everything. They, you know, might not be talking a lot um, and at a very, like, um, kind of holding a conversation kind of pace, but they are, you know, they are very aware of their surroundings and, you know, they're especially like their parents. Um, and gosh, yeah, I th- having all these people like making a fuss over and making sure that she doesn't see her mum would have probably added to her distress. Definitely, yeah. So let's concentrate now on the man that attacked Alini for a moment. Do you remember that I told you that Alina must have recognised the car? Because mm, she well, ran immediately when she saw the Ford. Yes. Plan. Now she did recognise the car because it belonged to her estranged husband, Ricardo Godino. Now I'm going to come back to Alina and Ricardo and their history and what led up to this incident in a minute. But let's just finish what happened initially. So after Ricardo calmly walked off, he got back in his truck and he drove off. Once he had left the scene, he got on the phone to his friend Ronaldo and confessed to what he had just done. Now Ronaldo convinced him to meet him, and then he convinced him that the only right thing to do was to turn himself in. Though in all honesty, Rachel, it seems like he probably intended to do that anyway, but Ronaldo convinced him to turn himself in. Now on the way to the police station, the police actually spotted them anyway, and they pulled him over and arrested him before he could get to the police station. So now let's go back a little bit before we head off to the trial. So Alina and Ricardo, they're both Brazilian, having been born and brought up in Brazil. I've not been able to find out a massive amount about Ricardo and his upbringing, as for all intents and purpose, it seems like, like he had a pretty normal upbringing. Nothing untoward or out of the ordinary happened to him. 
He was born in the city of Belo Horizonte in Brazil in 1981. Nalini was also born in Belo Horizonte in 1980, making her just under a year older than Ricardo. Now, her life was a little more tough than when she was growing up. She had three siblings in total, one sister and two brothers. Both her mother and her father would drink a lot, and it was a very abusive relationship, not towards her kids, but her father would often be verbally and emotionally abusive towards her mom, and occasionally physically abusive as well. Now, Alini was the second oldest sibling, her, and the oldest daughter, so a lot of her childhood was spent looking after her siblings. Her parents would often spend extended periods away from the home on drinking sessions, and were often not capable when at home, so she'd be the one who would cook, clean, wash the clothes, make sure they were all okay for school, and everything else you'd usually expect from the parental figures. So Alini and Ricardo, they met in 2001 initially. Alini worked in a clothes store, and Ricardo was a delivery driver for the clothes store. Now, it would take two years of friendship and working together before they started dating, with friends and family commenting on how much they were in love and how well they suited each other. They both wanted more for each other and their relationship, and they were looking how they could get more when Ricardo found out he was eligible for an Italian passport due to his ancestry. So they expanded their horizons to Europe, and they both came to the conclusion that they wanted to move to England, and to London specifically. So around six months after they started dating, they got they got together in March 2003, so in September of 2003, they moved to London. Now Ricardo, he had his Italian passport, so he would be okay moving, but Alini didn't. So they obtained, in Brazil, a fake marriage certificate, so there'd be no issue in her moving with him. So they both worked hard, trying to make their new life a success, with Ricardo taking manual labour jobs, jobs as a handyman and things like that, and Alini took a job as a cleaner in a hostel in London. Now life was tough for them, but they were happy, with Alini making friends and then becoming best friends with another Brazilian who works at a hostel, Vanessa. So in time, Vanessa and Alini will set up their own small business, making Brazilian sweet treats, and cakes, with Alini doing most of the baking, and her friend handling the delivery and admin aspects of the business. Now, it was a relative success, especially with the Brazilian and Portuguese community, with Alini specialising in birthday cakes. So on, on her personal front, Alini's relationship with Ricardo was going from strength to strength, with them both welcoming their first child, Ricardo Jr., into the family. Now, Ricardo Jr., he would have a few medical problems, Rachel. Nothing life-threatening, but ones that would need repeat care and surgery. So in 2008, five years after they moved to the UK, they decided to move back to Brazil and deal with Ricardo Jr.'s medical issues there, where they would be surrounded by family who could help them. While their son would in time get all the medical treatment he needed and would recover, so no issues on that side, they moved back to Brazil would be the start of their problems in their relationship. The pair would go on to have two more sons with each other, and Ricardo, unfortunately, would develop a drug habit, which would cause arguments between the pair. Ricardo would also start to become verbally and emotionally abusive towards Alini, with Alini's family recalling one incident where he threatened to strangle her. And she he probably would, not- would have she probably would have been looking to avoid a relationship like that, having seen what her parents grew up in and that environment that she was exposed to as their child, wouldn't she? So that would have just yeah. been devastating for her, being with him for so long, having three children with him, and then for him to, you know, ha- kind of have this drug habit and start being verbally and physically abusive towards her would have just been devastating, I, I can't imagine. Yeah, especially because Alini, by all, Bayorka Gava was just 100% focused on family and her children. So, so yeah, it would have been. He would often threaten to kill himself or her if they broke up. The pair would eventually split up for a short period of time, but Ricardo wanted to give the family and relationship another go. He didn't want it to be over, 
and he wouldn't give up. Now, Alini would eventually agree to give their relationship an over attempt, but only on a couple of key conditions, Rachel. Firstly, Ricardo would seek help for his drug problem, and secondly, they would leave Brazil and move back to the UK. I think that's fair. That's yeah. not, you know, they're not unrealistic requests, and um, I guess their intention was always to move back to the UK. Yeah, I believe so. It's just his drug problem got in the way. So Ricardo happily agreed to both points if it meant the family would move back in together. So in 2013, they would move back to the UK, settling in with a Brazilian couple they knew, Luciano and Henrique. With being back in the UK, one of two things Ricardo promised he would do, he also worked on the second one, and he went off to rehab to try to address his drug problem. He would initially move away from drugs, but eventually would still use and abuse them with differing levels of frequency right up until he killed Alini. Would you, sorry to interrupt and, and yeah. just put a pin in that there, would you have to pay for rehab privately in the UK? Like, you, No, you can, it, it, you can pay for it privately or you can get it on the NHS. But in 2019, I guess, oh no, when did they move back to the UK? Sorry. 2013. 2013. I'm guessing it, you'd, you'd be put on a waiting list, right? And not it necessarily dep- like maybe seeing somebody as regularly as, as like a... Would that rehab perhaps be like a meeting a week instead of an intense kind of like you're kind of in a, in a, in a place where you can totally recover from a drug habit or any other habit indeed? It all depends. Most rehabs are impatient, but... Right. It depends on where in the UK you are. Oh, okay. So some places you can, so, and they were in like basically a leafy suburb, so it might have been a little bit quicker. I, yeah. I didn't okay. get, I didn't get how long it took for him to get into the rehab. Yeah. Um, I just know that he got in there, so he may have been wait, waiting a while for it. Cool. Just curious, and my reasoning behind that being is like how seriously he'd have taken it, and I guess. The intention there is that sometimes if, if you're if you're forking out and say they both had to take on that extra work to pay for rehab for him, it it might have been like more of a priority than him getting it, for instance, on the NHS and and not taking it as seriously. If that makes sense. No, that makes perfect sense. I'm I'm fairly almost certain certain that they didn't pay for it themselves. Because yeah. at the start they didn't have the money, um, but he he did give up for a while. But yeah, he went back to them, uh, and yeah, like I said, because life was hard for them, because mm-hmm. they they had to start all over again, uh, with Luciano, their friend, who they were living with, say one time her and her partner were woken up by Alini calling them, saying that Ricardo had become physically abusive, strangling her for a while while she when she threatened to leave him. I, I take it. Obviously, she'd set these conditions when they were back in Brazil, but yeah. coming back to the UK, she was she was firmly sticking by them. She wasn't like a a bit of a pushover. She was saying, "Right, no, you're clearly not in recovery. I am. I'm going to leave you." No, unfortunately, not. Like he, it it wasn't the reason why they were. I know I said they were estranged when she died. That wasn't the reason why. So it seems like oh. she she'd given up on getting him completely off the drugs or, or he kept promising and then going back to it. I don't know, but it wasn't the reason why they they would eventually split up. Okay. Um, Ricardo would, though, he would deny uh, strangling her, saying that he was just putting his hand over her mouth to shut her up for a little bit. And eventually, Alini would say that she was initially mistaken and he didn't try to strangle her just, wow. make, just to make her be quiet. Now, Obviously, this is just estimated guesses, but to me, that sounds like she's just said that out of fear or something similar, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And if he's threatened to do something to her children, you know, she'd quite easily retract a statement, wouldn't she? Yeah. Now, as they became more settled and more on their feet, they moved into their own house. And it seems like their relationship with each other had improved, from the outside at least. In 2016, Ricardo set up his own company, Goodino Maintenance, which grew quite rapidly 
with Alini handi- handling the admin side for him, and occasion still baking, but more as a hobby or on individual requests from friends, rather than to make money. In 2017, and going forward, the pair would continue their arguments, with Alini becoming increasingly unhappy and wanting out of the relationship. But also, she felt trapped, because the vast majority of the income were virtually all the income that was generated by Ricardo. And by this time, they had four kids together because she had given birth to her daughter. So she couldn't see a way out for herself. Also, you have to remember her status in the UK was was also questionable, given the pair were not officially married. They had a fake marriage certificate. And that being something that Ricardo would often hold over her to stop her leaving. Now, she did try to leave him on several occasions. Now, along with the other things I mentioned, he would also keep to his usual routine of threatening to either kill himself or her if she did. There was one instance a friend recalled where Alini had called her because she had said she had been trapped in the bedroom for a full day and night with her kids due to Ricardo and his behaviour while high. And she asked if her friend's partner could come over around on the pretense of taking Ricardo out of the house so she could get out of the bedroom to feed and give drinks to the kids. Now imagine that, Rachel, having to like basically lock yourself in a bedroom with nothing to eat or drink with four frightened children. Yeah, and then having to call your friend and almost kind of admit, like, I'm in this situation. Cause I imagine, um, like with many... Um, people that are in these relationships at home with abusive either physically or verbally partners um that you know what goes on behind closed doors stays behind closed doors so admitting to a friend that you need their help to to you know act as a decoy um and get rid of him must have been you know quite shameful for her not saying that she should be at all but um you know it would have taken quite a bit of courage to build up and, and say, hey, can you help me so that I can get my kids fed? That's heartbreaking. It is, yeah. It is. I, I completely agree with you there, Rachel. Towards the end of 2018, while in an argument, Ricardo would reveal that he was having an affair with another woman and that he wanted to leave Alini and start a family with the other woman. Now, it's widely believed that this was a lie. He had no intention of leaving Alini and he didn't even have another woman. It was just another ploy to scare her and make make her convince him not to leave so she wouldn't because she wouldn't be able to support their four kids by herself. It backfired on Ricardo though, Rachel. Because this was, however, the catalyst that Lini needed to convince herself that she needed to leave Ricardo for good and take the kids with her. So in December of 2018, three months before she was killed by Ricardo. She left him, reporting him to the police and moving into a friend's home. Wow, quite quite a big statement going to the police as well, given, you know, that he'd held over her for so long that um, she was in the country illegally. Like, good honour. Yeah, definitely. Now, her friends rallied around her to support her. They created a WhatsApp group to make sure she had everything that she needed. Oh, emotionally and actually materially. And so she could support the kids and herself until she got sorted out. Now, Ricardo found out where she was, though, telling her that he reported her missing to the police, so they gave him her address. Now, the police would later deny this, and they would say that he found her using the Find My, Find My iPhone app, the iPhones have. He would go to the house that she was staying at and argue again threatening her with the home office, and also he ripped up the passports, the Italian ones that her kids had, so that she couldn't leave with them. He was angry, though, because he now knew that she'd be able to stay in the UK due to her kids being European, so that she would be granted to leave because her kids were allowed to be here. So he, didn't, he no longer could threaten her with that. On the 27th of December, 2018, Alini would once again report him to the police, and this time the social services would get involved, moving her and her kids to a safe house in South London. She would make a complaint against Ricardo on that day, one of domestic abuse, 
which is why the social services got involved, and Ricardo would be arrested, but later on that day he would be bailed out with bail conditions. So we couldn't see her, contact her, the usual stuff. Like no. he's gonna like a dear to them. He's got, you know, he's he's gotten away with so much for so long, he he'll be he'll be incensed by this, won't he? And yeah. You know, as we will go on to talk about probably. Yeah, no, yeah, you're right. Now, for some reason, the specialist safeguarding investigation unit of Surrey Police, they would downgrade her risk to medium, thinking that she wasn't at risk. Now, what she didn't know at the time was that Ricardo had access to her iCloud account, so he could read her emails and he could track her and monitor her from afar. What she also didn't know was, now do you remember that WhatsApp group that was set up by her friends and, yeah. and had her in it? Well, it would turn into a support group, not only for what she needed, but generally too, for emotional support. She would tell them what she's doing with her day, and she would also tell them where she's going for safety so they would know where she's at all the time. Well, Ricardo, he'd gotten a hold of one of her old SIM cards, so he managed to join a group and no one noticed he was in there because the name said Alini, so he was seeing everything they were talking about. He was seeing every movement she made, and why she posted in there, and what she was feeling, when she was afraid, when she was scared, all those things. He is just another level, isn't he? Yeah, he is, yeah. So despite the repeated complaints she made to the police about him, breaking his bail conditions and harassing her, and she made several. She kept going back and complaining. And also, despite the police finding out on the 11th of January that he knew where her safe house was because he was tracking her, on the 16th of January, all of his bail conditions were removed. So he no longer had any restrictions about contacting her. This is so bad. By now, Alini was telling the police that she believed he may kill her and that she was dreaming about it as well. She would tell friends that she was fairly certain he might kill or try to kill her. And she would tell them that the only thing that made her feel safe was she was also certain he wouldn't try anything while one or more of her kids were present, which is why she started taking her three-year-old daughter with her everywhere. She wouldn't leave the house without her and or one of the other kids. But he'll have seen this in the WhatsApp group, right? Yes. So obviously she's not aware, but because he now knows that, he's just going to take his opportunity at any point because she's always going to be with a child. Yeah, well, she was fairly certain because he loved his kids, he wouldn't do anything to cause them distress. But yeah, you're right. He would obviously take advantage of it, but she was just like, he may hate me, but he loves his kids, which is obviously, obviously bullshit, but... But I think I think absolutely no, I completely agree with you. But I also think his mind was probably working around that, you know, you're not gonna use my children as a guard yes. against me, you yeah. bitch. You know, I, point, I'm yeah. not for one minute suggesting that um she shouldn't have done that because absolutely you, you do what does make you feel safe and you obviously want to be around your children and make sure they're safe with you anyway, but that probably just again kind of um, lit the fire in him, didn't it? Yeah, no, I think actually, no, you said that. I think you're probably exactly right. His thinking was probably something like, How dare you try and use my kids against me? Like you said, I'm going to show you that. You'd imagine that, wouldn't you? Yeah, you're right. Now, on the day that she was killed, just under four hours before that tragic event, she would file yet another report to the police at 11 30 that morning, complaining about Ricardo because. Do you remember the WhatsApp group? Yeah. Well, he had left that WhatsApp group, and only by doing so did everyone realise that he'd been in there all along. Oh, shit. So a meeting was set up the following day to discuss it with her. Why did he leave the WhatsApp group, though? It was never found out, yeah. Maybe he was planning to kill her that day, so he thought, I don't need to be here anymore. Oh, who knows? But, um, but yeah, so the police, like, she went to the Surrey police. I know she... Yeah, and they, because she was now in London, they contacted the Metropolitan Police and said, and they arranged a meeting for the next day. But sadly, she would never be able to attend that meeting. 
This no. is just heartbreaking, isn't it? it? Is, like, it, yeah, it is. Yeah, Rachel, you're right. Now, on the day itself, CCTV would show Ricardo casually shopping before getting in his truck. CCTV from the bus would show Ricardo following the bus in his truck, sometimes driving aggressively and causing over cars to swerve to make sure that he kept up with the bus. This leads us up to the incident, Rachel, which I've gone over, so I'm not going to go over again. So when Ricardo would arrive at the police station with the police, he would openly admit to killing Alini. His DNA would be found in a knife handle with Alini's blood on the blade of the knife. And now, and also, as you said, like several people would be able to identify him as well. But he wasn't denying it, so so they didn't need to prove that it was him. He would, however, and this is becoming so much of a a bad trend with us, but he would plead not guilty to murder when it came to the trial. Yes. Pleading it's almost guilty. like you find these cases on purpose, Andrew. No, I don't. I swear to God, I um, I found this case and I didn't know the outcome when I started reading it. And then, um, but yeah, no, he he pled guilty. I think just most of them plead guilty to manslaughter, don't they? Because it's what's a, I guess, what's the harm in trying? Because even if they get found guilty of murder, they still get reduction for pleading. Did you hear that then? No, what was it? He's barking in his sleep. He's been growling and barking all no. day to sleep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think, yeah, they just do it because they, there's no downside, is there? Because if they fe- get, get found guilty of manslaughter, then they get reduced sentence anyway. Plus, they've already pled guilty to manslaughter, so they get a further reduced sentence. And then if they fe- get found guilty of murder, they still get a reduction for pleading guilty to manslaughter. So it's a, it's a win win. It's maybe it's something that should be stopped. But. Yeah. He would plead guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. He would say that he just lost control. So in the trial itself, he would stick to that defence, with the prosecution attempting to show that he was fully in control and that it was a cold-blooded murder. Now, the prosecution's case showed how he was abusive to her for years, how he was violent, how he was controlling, how in the months after they split up, he tracked her. He controlled her. He terrorized her. How on the day before he killed her, he had Googled and read up on a different case where a Brazilian man had killed his wife in the UK. How he, they, they told the jury how he had a knife in the car with him ready to attack. Now he wouldn't unsurprisingly take the jury along to, at all to find him guilty of murder, not manslaughter, with the judge giving him a minimum term of 27 years in total with a life sentence. But she's still gone. Like, yes. It's too little too late. And I don't know whether you watch much on-demand television, but there's um, something on ITV at the minute in the UK for our UK listeners called ITVX. And um, the the program, there's two, two things. There's a television program called Social Media Murders. And in almost all of the cases, and I say almost, there are the the odd two, maybe three out of like the nine, where it's not um, an ex lover or a stalker, and it is just a, you know, a genuine tragic like death of 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 the victim. Um, but in in majority of the cases, the police knew the stalker or the the um perpetrator who was harassing the victim and the victim themselves were just at a complete loss as to like filing police reports getting fed up with being told there's not much more that they can do and just to keep an eye out and change their routines and and you know like the the other thing i wanted to talk about was a podcast i'm listening to at the minute by the guardian called um can i tell you a secret and uh that it, I, I'm only midway through, so I can't give you my full review on it. But that in itself, these people that are being stalked um, on Facebook and, and through other ways, um, because they're hiding their IP addresses, the police, their hands are tied. And it infuriates me because these people are making their victims stay indoors all the time, you know, quit their jobs. They're getting them in trouble. They can't go out and, and socialize because there are, you know, these stalk the this particular stalker is like 
made their life unbearable. And like the police, their hands are tied. Yeah. And it's, you know, a lot of the time, and, and with this case as well, the police knew they had him on record, that he had a restraining order, but that's just not going to stop him. And, you know, it's taken for Alina to lose her life, for him to be locked behind bars. No, I, yeah. I don't know what I don't know what the solution is. Do you arrest and charge him with stalking, which might carry like ninety days? I don't know. He he probably would have got out on bail in that period of time. But like, what what is the alternative? What can be done? I don't know the answer to that one, Rachel. Um, it's not I, good though, is it? It's not good enough. No, it's not good enough. I agree with you. Yeah, but yeah, I don't know the answer to that one. Um. Well, yeah, I, I don't know what to say, Rachel. I'll, I'll go back to this because I, I have no answer for you, unfortunately. Sorry. But, uh, no, it's okay. I just, I, 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 no, I disagree completely. That's the problem. Um, but the judge gave him 27 years. And, so, yeah, some of her comments were on point. And I really wanted to read your over entire comments, but it's several pages long and I can't because you'd be, Rachel, you'd be killing me and you'd be falling asleep. So I'm just going to, talk about a few of them she commented on the fact that he stalked her that he tracked her that he armed himself with a knife and she said these were all aggravating matters she commented on the fact that alini screamed that she tried to run but she couldn't because of his daughter that's what she kept saying the judge kept saying to him because of your daughter she didn't say alini's daughter she kept making a point to him that he did this to his daughter um, yeah. she commented on the fact that he carried on stabbing her as she fell to the ground and that he left his daughter to watch her mother die and she said these were all aggravating points. She commented on a voicemail left by Alina just hours before her death to her sister in which she predicted she would die because of him. So I'm, getting, I'm getting teary here. So she commented on the fact other mothers and children witnessed what he did, traumatising them for life which was another aggravating matter. She did, She dismissed the prosecution's argument that it was premeditated in the fact that he'd been planning it for, for weeks. Um, but she did say that it was obvious that planning was involved, but he hadn't been planning it for weeks. She dismissed. She didn't say that it was unlikely. She just said the prosecution couldn't prove it. She dismissed the prosecution's argument that he had been abusive in a relationship. Because again, this is down to the prosecution. They failed to provide sufficient evidence for it happening. When they were together, they only provided evidence ed- evidence for it after they broke up. So she couldn't use that as an aggravating. Even though it was obvious, she couldn't use it as an aggravating point. She dismissed, however, the defense's argument that he didn't intend to kill her. Because, she said, he armed himself with a knife. She made a point of saying that it's highly unlikely he'd ever be released after the 27 years, so he must come to terms with that. But, Rachel, that was a point, sadly, she'd be wrong about. The judge would be wrong because Ricardo would appeal his sentence in as much as he didn't appeal his sentence or his conviction, but he appealed requesting that he be transferred to Brazilian prison to serve it. And the request was accepted by both the British and Brazilian authorities. Now, in Brazil, it's common to place such long-term prisoners in prisons near their families. So Ricardo will have the luxury of seeing his family regularly, something Alina's children and family will never do with her again. Yeah, that's madness. Like, oh, just appeal to his needs. You know, he's he's gotten everything he's wanted in terms of, you know, revenge and I yeah, I get it. He doesn't get to see his kids and and he's in prison for the rest of his life. But he's yeah, like you've just said, he's right close to his family. He's in his home country. Like, yeah. you know, just just cater to his needs. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, it's Madness. also it's also fairly certain that he's now going to be released automatically after twenty seven years. But <laughs> even if he isn't for whatever reason the maximum term he can stay in prison for his sentence in Brazil is 30 years. So the very worst case scenario is he's only going to do an extra three years maximum. And the judge made a point of saying that she don't, she didn't think he'd ever be out again while he was alive. But obviously, it no longer matters because he's not in the British uh, uh, justice yeah, system. system. Yeah. 
So there was an inquest into the death of Aline, with the police accepting major failings in her safeguarding, and the inquest put particular blame on a PC Diane Walker, who apparently decided early on that Ricardo was no risk at harming Aline, and that and all that led to all decisions being made about her being made on the basis that Ricardo was not a threat to Aline. Who is there is there some sort of system or chart or you know um scoring matrix that that gives them you know the outcome clearly not threat? No, this was just her opinion. Uh, so it's down to the individual who's well, it's not it's, it's not anymore. The inquest gave, I think, 28, I could be wrong about that number, but I think 28 points where the Surrey police failed and that they had to make changes to their systems. Mm. Um, That's just the yeah. Surrey police, though, isn't it? It's yeah. not like the entire justice system. And, like, I, I just feel like it, it feels to me, again, coming off the back of the recent kind of TV binging and podcasts and and you know this particular case and hearing of other cases that there's this basic flaw in in this scoring system right of not at risk um to the victim you know that that needs to be reviewed and uh you know potentially as well like bringing factors into it I, I don't have I don't have the answers and I'm just thinking out loud here but just bringing factors into it of like well if the victim is at risk, and, and we're not saying sh- she or he is at risk, but if they are, what's the worst thing that could happen? And if if one of those things is that it could result in like harm to to the mother, the father, or the child, whoever the victim is, um, then you know there need there needs to be like a more um kind of weight put on um those those assessments and and you know making sure that. The victim is at the heart of the the review, not the the perpetrator. Yeah, I agree, Rachel. So, so this is all, Rachel. He's now in Brazil, and from what I can gather, they can take things into him to make his stay more pleasant. It's a bit more different than the prisons over here. Uh, so, apart from what we've obviously already mentioned, what did you think of this one? Um, I didn't didn't like it. Uh, for obvious reasons, I think I've made it quite vocal throughout, haven't I? Like, that, like, it was just completely needless crime that escalated because he, you know, was just clearly an angry man that that got lost, or, you know, a bit lost in the system, really, and no one took took Alina seriously, and it's just heartbreaking. The whole case is heartbreaking. Yeah, I, I agree completely. Uh, shall I wrap this one up then, Rachel? Yeah, let's go for it. So this has been season three, episode 25, called Where's Mummy Gone? And if it's safe for you to do so, I'd like you to relax, close your eyes and picture the scene. Now, people make mistakes. I do. Rachel does. Now, all of you too, all of you do too, who are listening. But why would one police officer snap judgment on a domestic abuse report be of such an influence that would ultimately lead to a death of a person? Why would these decisions be left to just one subjective opinion? Now, thank you, everyone. And we will be back next week for our last episode in the season before we take a very short break. Thanks, guys.